paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. From all its cross, I thought that no one could all my sins erase. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Oh, such great pain my Lord endured. With he my sinful soul secure, I should have died there, but Jesus took my place. So now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. But Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He didn't give to me alone. He gave himself, now he's my own. He's gone to heaven to make for me a place. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Jesus paid a debt that I could never
fountains of my need. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to the Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. One more time. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Amen. All right. Well, let's open our Bible, shall we? We're going to be spending some time in the book of Ezekiel. But I've titled this message, God's Call to the Wicked. God's Appeal to You and I. Now, recently, I've been interacting with people from other religions. And I've noticed a noticeable difference between other religions and Christianity. Other religions tell us we have to be good. We've got to get there by our good works. We've got to get there by our own human achievement and our own goodness. Well, the Bible very clearly tells us that we can't be saved by our good works. The Bible, in fact, says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If I was to ask you this morning, what is a wicked person? We would be tempted to think of the bad people in human history. We would think of people like Hitler, Stalin, long list of names. And for sure, there are some people who have um, become worse sinners than others. There's different degrees that people tap into. But the Bible is very clear that apart from God's grace, No human being could or would be saved. So we must understand the true condition of man is that no one is really seeking God as we should. And human beings are not seeking for God, but the good news is God's seeking for human beings. And so the gospel is different to all other religions on planet Earth because it makes it plain that it's by grace alone that we are saved, not through anything that we've done or achieved, which is good news for the person who discovers their true condition, their true state of heart. Because when the Holy Spirit first begins to awaken you and begins to awaken your soul in reference to eternal realities, The scary thing is, as you look at your own heart, you realize, God, I know what your word is telling me to do, and I can't do it. 
And not only do I uh, lack, lack the ability to do it, but there's aspects of my heart where I really don't want to do it. And so you have to face that reality of seeking salvation, knowing that salvation isn't in you, and knowing that there's nothing you can really do to achieve salvation except put your trust in the only giver of it, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. So God's call to the wicked, God's appeal to you and I. Would you be offended this morning if I called you wicked? That's good news. You do realize that some people are offended, right? What if I was to tell you when God addresses the wicked, he's speaking to us? Now, you might say, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good person. Well, maybe from my vantage point you are. But God is looking at you from his own perfection. God sees things clearly. And if you think you're a pretty good person, and you think you should gain access into heaven by your own goodness, then at this point you do not know what the gospel is. And you need to know what the gospel is. The Bible says there is no one who is good. Who's right, the Bible or you? Who's right, the Bible or our current society? The Bible. The Bible says there is no one who is good. The Bible says there's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. You might say, well, I beg to differ. I've always sought God. But have you really? Have you really sought the God of the Bible? Or have you been seeking a God of your own imagination? There's a difference. The Bible says that we've all turned away and become worthless. And yet, we're not worthless in the sight of God, which is the good news. Now, Paul... In his day, as, before we get into Ezekiel, we hit Romans first. Because I want to address the passage in question here, where, what I presented in question form. You do understand that some of the hardest people to reach with the gospel are actually religious people. Because religious people think they're okay. We actually think we're doing just fine. We've actually lied to ourselves and think, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Now, in Paul's day, in Paul's culture, as he's writing this book of Romans, explaining the gospel, Paul had two different types of people in mind. He had the Gentiles. Guess what bracket we all fall into? We fall into the bracket of Gentile, right? Unless you were born a Jew. There were Jews and Gentiles. And Paul, as he's reiterating the wickedness of man, if you were a Jew, if you were a religious Jew, you would find yourself agreeing with everything that Paul said. You would say, yep, those people, those Gentiles, they're wicked. There is a temptation in religious people that when we use the term wicked, we're tempted to do this instead of doing this. Yeah, and I see confirmation, Matthew. Matthew pointing at Gordon. But anyway, <laughs> um, but that is an issue. And in order for the church to reach the world, we have to first acknowledge our own wickedness. Otherwise, our message will be nothing more than a self-righteous message. And it will come across as a moralistic type presentation that, hey, if you did what I did, and if you can follow my example, then you can be accepted by God too. No, we're here to tell you that we ourselves have been very wicked, and God has saved the wicked. But the Jews here, I believe, are a reflection very often of those of us who have been raised in church our whole life. And if we're not careful, the longer we go to church, and I recommend we do go to church, 
But the longer we go to church, there are pitfalls that can happen in our life where we start to hear terms and messages towards the wicked that we can say, well, that's no longer addressing us. That's addressing the people outside the building, outside the church, where I'm here to tell you it's addressing us as well. So Paul had to deal with this attitude. And if you look at Romans 1 and Romans 2, first of all, he deals with the Gentiles. But then, secondly, he deals with the Jew, who would have agreed 100% with what Paul had said, because they're doing this rather than doing this. So then Paul addresses the Jew in chapter 2 and in, and in part of chapter 3. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? What's Paul's verdict? No. Religion doesn't save. Christ saves. Church doesn't save. Jesus saves. And we can delude ourselves into thinking we are saved when we are not. Because we can be right at the pale of salvation, even under the hearing of God's word, and yet never having been born again, and never having received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What then, Paul said, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And that's true. You see, the believer after salvation and after they get born again, it doesn't suddenly stop being by grace. It's still by grace. And the beauty of the gospel presentation, as one person put it, when we evangelize, it's like one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. And I believe in that concept. That we preach a message of grace alone, faith alone. We preach the same gospel that saved us. We don't start preaching a different message the moment we are saved. We preach the same message of hope and salvation to those who do not know Christ. Do you realize there's people out there who think that they're too wicked to be saved? Do you think, well, well look at your own life for a, for, for a moment. Maybe you were in that category where you thought you had sinned away the day of God's grace and now God was done with you, and the only thing you had to look forward to was his future judgment. If God could save you and I, then there's hope for everyone in our community. Amen? The good news, the gospel. Now, Romans 3, 10 through 12. Turn with me there, please. Romans 3, 10 through 12. Paul establishes the reality of universal sin. A preacher who has millions of followers said that 99.5% people are actually good. And this preacher has millions of followers. Consider that for a moment. Would the Bible agree with this preacher? No. So if I'm a preacher and I'm actually preaching that 99.5 people are actually pretty good, what kind of message would I be giving? Amen. And people would be trying to improve themselves and thinking, hey, I'm pretty good. I got this. And then it's not by grace at all. It's by your own human achievement. But notice this statement by the Lord here through the book of Psalms in the book of Romans. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, the preacher got it wrong 99.5% people aren't pretty good. 0%. 0% are good in the eyes of God. Well, I'm looking at it from good. 100% uh, uh, aren't good. 0%. Which means that you and I must be saved by the same Lord, the same Savior, the same cross, the same blood, the same grace, the same faith. We have the same message, the same gospel. And as the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The only way that you and I can stand righteous before a holy God is to receive a gift of righteousness that's not our own. A perfect God requires a perfect righteousness. That's why you and I cannot be saved by our own righteousness. It is an imputed righteousness, a righteousness given by faith in Christ. In other words, because Jesus took all of our sin, he can give us all of his righteousness. And that's what makes it by faith. So when God looks at the believer, he now views you as the very righteousness of Christ himself. And that's the only thing that can save you and I, period. So if you're still holding on to the hope that, hey, I'm a pretty good guy or I'm a pretty good woman, then you're barking up the wrong tree and there is no salvation in that issue. You're still lost if that's the case. Sometimes we have to declare the bad news before we can declare the good news. But some of us are already aware of the bad news because we've been living with our hearts for some time now and trying to do the religious things correctly and finding a lack of power in ourselves to be able to do what God's law requires. Oh, receive the grace of God today. Receive the love of God today for your soul. Put your whole faith and trust in Christ and you will not be disappointed. So, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. None of us have gotten it right. There is none that seeks after God. This is God's declaration as he looks at the whole human race. God isn't saying there's no one that's religious, but he's saying there's none that truly seek after me. There's none that seek after God. So if you as a human being find yourself seeking after God, it's because God first sought after you. It's because God first called upon you. God awakened you for this seeking. But prior to that, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. In relation to God, the scripture clearly says. They are all gone out of the way. I guess the one consolation is we're not alone on that issue. We've all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. That's God's verdict, not mine. Now, you might be tempted to think, well, in the human race, there's a lot of good things that happen. Well, let's not forget we were made and created in God's image. So any goodness that does seem to happen in humanity is a byproduct of God's creation work within us. But we, don't, we certainly don't give him any of the credit, do we? Now, if by chance you are struggling with your own self and feeling like, well, I'm too wicked to be saved, I've got good news for you. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Let's go there. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. My message to you this morning is this. If you're too wicked to be saved, why is God still offering salvation and repentance? Repentance and salvation. Why is he giving you and I the opportunity to repent if God doesn't want to save you? Why is the Bible full of declarations of Turn and live. Repent. I don't take pleasure in the death of evil people or wicked people. Rather that you come and repent. So this is God's gracious opportunity. And the message of the gospel is a message of repentance. Repentance is God's opportunity for the person that's not right with God to become right with God. To receive his forgiveness. Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Isn't that good news? God, had, God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. This morning I was in 
discussion with someone online that's a hyper-Calvinist. And uh, he was making it sound like God relishes the idea, you know, of um, the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. I think we're all aware of that verse. And it's almost like God's relishing to send people to hell. And I'm like, I think you're missing the point here. God's not relishing that. God is perfectly righteous in passing judgment upon us, the judgment and sentence we deserve. But God's not relishing the idea of banishing people to hell. Amen. Then we would just preach to the people with yellow stripes on their back, and you get the analogy. Um, we're called to preach the gospel to everyone. Everybody. And Ezekiel was sent to a people where the vast majority wouldn't even listen to what he has to say. Let's face it, guys. One reason why we don't like to evangelize sometimes is because it doesn't have great production. It has a high rejection rate, doesn't it? And if you have a pragmatic bone in your body, evangelism is probably the last thing you'll want to do. In other words, if you want to present the gospel like some kind of salesman, and you're going to pitch the gospel based on salesmanship, you might be disappointed with the percentage of those who do actually receive in comparison with the percentage of those who reject. And if we're not careful, we can start looking at evangelism in some kind of pragmatic way where we can say, why even evangelize? Because people are just rejecting it anyway. How many of you know that's a sin on our part when we start to think that way? We are called to evangelize because the gospel is people's only hope of salvation. You and I have the only message that can save the human soul. Regardless of whether they receive or reject, it's our obligation to present it. We must be found faithful in the presentation of the gospel. Over the years, I've had people say, me, say to me, why do you hand out Bibles? Some people just throw it away. Well, we are not responsible for what people do with those Bibles, but we are responsible for getting the truth of God's Word into their hands. My sister was given a Bible. She never read it, but I did. So you never know where those Bibles are going to go, where those tracks are going to go. Let's not base the importance of evangelism based on the reception or lack thereof, but let's do it as a faithful act unto God, as love for God first, and then love for people second. Because if you love a human being, you will want that person to be saved above anything else. Pray for them. Pray that salvation occurs. Pray for our own hearts that we don't become hardened in the process of the delivery of evangelism. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Oh, my friends, as long as there is breath in our body, there's always a hope that uh, if we are wicked, that we can turn from our way and live. Turn back. Turn back. Notice the double emphasis. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Now again, as we read this passage, we are tempted to think that this statement was just written for Israel. Well, let me clarify. It was written to Israel, but, but it was written for us. So that we would gain something of an understanding of the heart of God towards those who hate him. That he actually wants them saved, not lost. He takes no pleasure in their death, but rather that they would repent. So this was written for us, so that we get an inkling of God's heart towards those who hate him. So that we don't end up hating them in return, but we end up realizing that, wow, at some point, the love of God could break through into their life. Because let's not forget, it is by grace, you know, by grace alone. Now he goes on to say in Ezekiel 18, 23, 
Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? God gets far greater pleasure out of a wicked person who repents than a person who doesn't repent and perishes in their sins. God delights in repentance. God is a merciful God. He's a forgiving God. He's a gracious God. And the sooner we start believing that, the sooner we are able to repent. A lot of people don't repent because you really don't think that God will forgive you. Well, we need to get to know this God more to understand that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. He's kind. He's long-suffering. If God really set his mind just to judge you, wouldn't he have judged you by now? Why is he giving you space? He's giving you space to repent. Like the verse that um, was shared this morning, 2 Peter 3, 9. God is long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. That's what he wants. Not that everyone will, but he wants it. And so should we. Um, the Bible even says, pray for those in authority. How many of you know it's really hard to pray for people in authority? Right? One person one time told me, yeah, pray them out of office. I'm like, I don't think that's what 2 Timothy's talking about. It's talking about praying for their salvation. And it says, for this is the will of God. Now, isn't it amazing? The moment we start homing in on people's salvation, we're actually homing in on the will of God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, right? Even those kind of people who wants them all to repent. And as we begin to evaluate from eternity, we don't envy the wicked because we realize this could be their best life now. If you're a Christian, this is not your best life now. I hope it isn't. Because that means you're not a Christian. Your best life is on the way. And yes, God does bless us in this life. But this life is full of trials and trouble and problems and losses. But in heaven, there are no troubles. There are no trials. There are no problems or losses. Everything is finally perfect. So this is not your best life now. Thank God. It is if you're not a Christian, but if you're a Christian, this is not your best life now. We live for the life to come, and our life does become better because godliness has a profit for the life that now is and the life that is to come. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. I remember in my own life, as I'm trying to find the Lord, as the Lord's showing me my own heart, I realized that I would cover the qualification of being someone that was wicked and hoping that God would forgive me, hoping that God could save me, but not expecting it because I realized I don't deserve it. All but when God opened my heart and showed me his love for me, his grace for me, then I realized if God could love me at my very worst, he would not stop loving me in the future days ahead. Now, Ezekiel 3, 4, let's go there. Aren't you glad you're not a prophet? I often wonder about those people who try and become prophets, you know, and I'm like, Man, don't you realize that you better get it 100% correct all of the time? And don't you realize that if you were a true prophet, the persecution that would ensue with it? No one in their right mind would want to be a prophet. And Ezekiel was called by God to be a prophet. And even though we're not prophets, capital P, thank God, we're called to be his witnesses as Christians. We're called to evangelize. And the 
message of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, as we preach Christ, we're preaching Christ's heart to the world, his will, his desire that all should come to salvation and not perish. Now, I bring this out because Ezekiel was sent to a people who were not going to listen to him. Have you ever evangelized or you sense God sending you to evangelize to people even though you know they're not going to listen? Have you ever wondered why God does that? I know I have. It's because he cares about the people he's sending you to, right? Right? Often, when I've evangelized people and they've rejected it, I go away thinking, well, there's hope still that somewhere down the road they're going to get it because an instant rejection doesn't always mean a complete rejection later on. You might be the one that stirred up the soil of that person's heart and you're the one receiving the brunt of that hatred towards God in their heart and the hostility But make no mistake, ground must be churned up before the seed can be planted. So don't walk away from that thinking it's a lost cause, it's a failure. No, God may have used you as a a digging hole, you know, (laughs) for that situation to occur. Now, Ezekiel is sent to the people of God in captivity. Now, now you would think that the people in captivity would finally listen. But you know what? The majority of them did not. Let's read this. And he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. Now, you do understand that we have God's words right here. These are God's words. I don't have to hide away, and I don't have to seek some kind of audible voice to come up with God's Word. God's Word is right here. It's right here. So we are commanded to speak the very words of God. He said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. And he goes on to say this, For you are not sent to a people of foreign speech, and a hard language, but to the house of Israel. I like to think as English people, um, you know, English-speaking people, excuse me, we, uh, I agree with the statement, we are a people divided by a common language. And coming here from Britain to America, especially in the early days, I realized the separation of language Because even though I would speak in English, people would laugh and not understand what I was saying. Because English and American isn't quite the same English. Are you with me? It's a little different. And English is quite diverse. But in, in Ezekiel's case, he was sent to a people who clearly understood him. He did not need a gift of tongues to be understood or an interpreter to be understood. He was speaking to his own people. Not only is he speaking to his own people, he's speaking to a very people who would be claiming the God who he is representing. Yet here's a weird thing. The Bible warns us in these last days, one of the final descriptions of the last day people is that they would have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Now, you do understand in Ezekiel's day, it was still the same. They would claim the God of Israel, but they would not obey the God of Israel. They would claim the God of Israel, but they would not truly worship him and give their lives over to him. Because if they were really the people of God, then they would be receiving what Ezekiel has to say. There are many people who claim to love Jesus but they reject what Jesus has to say. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. One of the signs that you love Jesus is that you actually love what he has to say. My friend, if you're claiming to love Jesus and you hate what Jesus says, then you're worshiping a Jesus of your own imagination, not the true Jesus of the Bible. 
because our only real access to Jesus is by the very words that he has spoken. That's our only access to him. He's not here physically, but he's left us his words and he sent his spirit to live within us. So our only real access to Jesus is the very word of God itself. Oh, Ezekiel, I'm sending you to a people who profess to know me by name, but they're going to reject what you, what, what you have to say because really they're not following me. Make no mistake, one of the most wicked things that, we, that you and I can do, even though it might look pretty good, is to have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, deny the source of that very godliness then that will not be to your credit. That will be to your condemnation at the end of the day. Now, he goes on to say, not to many peoples of foreign speech and a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely, if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. Now, wait a minute. I remember first reading this, and I remember being very pragmatic. You don't you understand what I mean by pragmatic. You're looking for results, right? And I was exposed to ministries that they were ruled by pragmatic spirit. In other words, they ran the church like it was a business. And uh, so they tried to save souls and percentage. And of course, we're all into growth. We want to see people come to Christ. But if we're not careful, passages like this can throw us for a loop because it's like, Ezekiel, if I sent you to a foreign land, they would listen to what you have to say, and they would actually receive you. But guess what? I'm not sending you there. I'm sending you to a people who will not listen to what you have to say. Surely that should show us that God is not pragmatic in his ministry presentation. God's into faithfulness. There was a time in my life that I prayed, God, just send me the people who will receive. I'm tired of this rejection. Show me people who will receive the gospel. God's never answered that prayer. You know why? Because he wants the gospel to be preached to those who will reject it as well. You realize that? The only failure in evangelism is not sharing Christ. It's not a failure if you shared Christ and people have rejected it. The result doesn't belong to you. The result belongs to God. Paul put it this way. One man sows, another man waters, but it's God who gives the increase. I mean, let's face it. If I evangelize and people got saved through my evangelism, I'd be tempted to start boasting and bragging and saying, hey, it was by my works that these people came to Christ. No. Very often when I've seen people come to Christ, they've come to Christ in spite of my poor and shoddy presentation. I might have even messed the whole thing up. But God reaches them through his grace. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who are perishing. It's the Christ we are presenting that saves, not our presentation. Even if you could give the most perfect presentation without Christ touching that person's heart by his grace, they would still not be saved. So it's not your presentation. It's the Christ who gives the grace that saves. So not too many people of foreign speech and a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. If I was Ezekiel, I'd be praying, God, send me there instead, please. I want to see results. But God sent him to a people who would not listen, a people who would not hear. So don't forget that. As you evangelize, God is sending you to those very same people who may just keep rejecting but here's a, here's a thought. They will never forget the opportunity that was presented to them. God will bring it to their remembrance. And God will say, I brought that person to preach Christ. And that person might be tempted to say, yeah, but Lord, if it was you, surely you would have sent someone better. Surely you would have sent someone nicer. 
surely you would have sent someone that had a much better life than that person. Oh, God is a gracious God. And it's not the plate that you eat. It's the food on the plate that you eat. And uh, God will say, I sent that person. And you rejected. I sent that person. It was me. Oh, God, if you were to show up and reveal yourself from heaven, then I could have been saved. But that's not God's way of saving. God's chosen way of saving is through the preaching of his word. Whether it be done one-on-one, -on -one, track presentation, giving Bibles in print form, God wants to save human beings through the people of God. That's his chosen way. There's been moments God may choose to do different, but that's not the norm, right? God's chosen means is through the preaching and declaration of his word. Printed form, spoken word, it's always by his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, he goes on to say, but the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you. Then I'm, you know, and I remember reading this. I'm like, well, well, God, why did you even send him? Why even bother? Why even bother sending Ezekiel to these people who would not listen to what he has to say? That, my friend, is the grace of God, the kindness of God. Now, let's face it, even though Ezekiel was rejected, we still have his words in Scripture, don't we? And many people have been blessed by what Ezekiel has to say because it was to Israel but for us. The house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you. Think of Noah. Was Noah successful in his preaching in terms of numbers coming to salvation? No. How many were saved in the era of Noah? Noah's family, and how many was that? Eight people, right? And so there were multitudes who perished in the flood. But you know what? Moses preached to them, do you know for how long? A hundred years. Speaking of God's long suffering, he raised up Noah to preach to that generation for a hundred years, and only eight souls were saved. But I'm glad those eight souls were saved because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. Right? God speaking to Israel through his prophet Isaiah. He said, if I didn't leave for you a remnant, you would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? No one left. And God was encouraging Abraham to pray. And Abraham was stood to pray. And finally, God said, if I find 10 people who are following me, who are righteous, I will not destroy it. Isn't that God merciful? Well, he only found one, Lot. And I often wonder why he was called righteous. Man, let's say, if he's called righteous, there's hope for all of us. Have you read the story of Lot? God had to forcefully remove him. Lost everything, but he was still saved. Thank goodness. My friends, if God wasn't gracious, none of us could or would be saved. We would have perished if it wasn't for his grace. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Does that describe the people in Rock Springs? Does that describe us? Apart from the grace of God? Yes. Gordon's pointing at himself. That's good news. That means you got the first part of the sermon. We are very often hard-headed, and we, are, we do very often have a stubborn heart. And were it not for the grace of God, we would stay hard-headed and stubborn-hearted. But God's grace breaks us. One of the most difficult hard-headedness and stubborn-heartedness is when it's done in a religious way because that's more deceptive. We refuse to change. We refuse to move on. We refuse to grow. 
because by golly, we're right and we're not going to let anyone else tell us any different, right? Then if that's our mindset, we're not going to grow spiritually. We have to be open for correction. We have to be open that possibly we've gotten some things wrong here, right? Stay teachable. Receive the word of God with meekness, gentleness, which is able to save your soul. Oh, God, break our hard forehead and break our stubbornness of heart and help us to receive your word. Now, you'll find, though, one of the reasons why evangelism is kind of neglected is because of this very issue. Well, God, if I go to these people and they reject what I have to say, it's just going to destroy me. Well, here's the good news. God has equipped you by his Holy Spirit. He has given you his spirit to be a witness. He has given you his word. He has equipped us with other things, tracks. Even if you're not very good at speaking, he's given you things to be able to hand out. Amen? But God says this about Ezekiel. You'll be surprised how God can toughen you up. Now, I'm not recommending this approach, but as a brand new believer, I had a lot of rough edges and there was this one guy I was working with. He grabbed me by the throat and he said, quit talking about Jesus. So I grabbed him back and I said, make me. And then he backed off. Now, I don't recommend that approach. I was still I was rough around the edges, you know. And thank, thank God we didn't get into fisticuffs, you know. But he was surprised because there's one thing I learned in England. People who never have read their Bibles... They all know the scripture, turn the other cheek. Although I do think they've gotten that somewhat wrong, but we won't go there. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So anyway, um, we, we kept evangelizing. That's what we'll say. But God says this, Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. In other words, there is a strength and resoluteness. There is, there is a hard foreheadedness when it's for truth. It's the right issue. Ezekiel, they're going to scold you, reject what you have to say, but I'm going to make you harder than they are. And you're going to keep preaching my word in the face of rejection. You're going to keep sharing my word. And I'm going to give you a harder forehead than their forehead because your hardness of forehead is given by my Holy Spirit. A slave to righteousness. Woe is me, Paul said, if I do not preach the gospel, right? And that when we have that sense in us that if we don't preach the gospel, we disobey God, then boy, that drives you to keep preaching, to keep sharing. Share the whole Bible, not just some of it, the parts that people don't like. It's all the word of God. Now notice, God goes into more detail here. And mine says, like emery, I guess another translation is diamonds, like, like emery, harder than flint, have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. Israel, my people, I'm sending you, Ezekiel, my prophet. The Bible says he sent the prophets day and night to minister to his own people. In captivity, he's still sending the prophets. They're rejecting the prophets still, but I send them anyway. I sent them my only son. Surely they will receive him. No, they killed him, murdered him. And then that generation suffered as a consequence, 70 AD. But God is still reaching out, still reaching out to the rebellious, to those who are refusing to serve God. Let's not be dismayed at their looks. Let's not focus on that, but let's focus on Christ, who wants us to share his word with them. Now, if you're here this morning and you're wondering, how can I be saved? How can I be a Christian? 
Um, I can't find God. I've been searching for him everywhere. I want to hear what God has to say, but how do I know? Well, turn with me to Romans 10, 6 through 7. Romans 10, 6 through 7. And I want to read this out. And then I want to look at the quotation so that you get the right understanding of what Paul is actually saying in this passage. We'll read Romans 10, 6 through 7, but we'll also go to Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, and read on from where Paul quotes. In other words, salvation is within our reach. It's abundantly available for all of us. It's there to be taken. It's there for the receiving. It's there for the taking. This is why we preach the gospel. This is why the gospel is good news. And notice he said, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, as a person, you might be tempted to say, God is so mystical. I, I, I don't know what he's saying. Um, you might look at it as trying to obtain the golden fleece to obtain salvation. Or oh, if you've never seen that movie, it's a classic, Jason and the Golden Fleece. But he went through hell and high water to obtain that golden fleece. Couldn't look at Medusa, was it? Or it would be turned into stone. Thank God that um, our salvation has been achieved for us by Christ. He's done all the brunt. He's done all the work. His work is finished. It's yours for the receiving. It's yours for the taking. It's yours for the reception. God has done everything he's going to do. It's within our reach. His message is within our reach. Now turn with me to Deuteronomy 30 verse 11, and then you'll get what Paul is saying here in this passage. Even in the days of Moses, God's word was known in the laws of Moses. But we've been given something greater than Moses. Christ has come. The word became flesh. We have our New Testament. We have the spoken word of God in the New Testament. We have everything that God is saying to us in the New Testament scriptures as well as the old. The new completes the old. We have the completed article. Christ has come. The message is now here for us. And he goes on to say here, for this commandment that I command you today, it is not too hard for you. In other words, it's plain enough that even a child can receive salvation. It's not too hard for you. It's not so complicated. Neither is it far off. It's not unobtainable. And he goes on to say, this is what Paul's quoting, it is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Oh, my friend, we have access right here in this book. Everything that God wants you to know, everything that God is saying to us, it's in this book right now. It's right here. Now, if you've never read the Bible before, you might get a little lost in Leviticus. I would encourage you, go to John's Gospel. Go see what Jesus himself has said and receive what he has said today. And you will not be disappointed. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Um, neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us, and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But notice this. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. In other words, as you hear the gospel presented, you have the opportunity, as you're hearing Christ presented, to put that same word in your mouth, to receive that word in your heart and be saved. Isn't that good news? That's awesome news, that you can be saved on the spot. And you can live this marvelous new life that Christ has given. Now he goes on to say, and I do believe the gospel presentation is this. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Life and death is presented in the gospel 
message. The final verse, the final passage, Romans 10. Turn, turn back there, Romans 10, verse 8 through 13. Paul is quoting the passage I read to you in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Do not say who's going to go into heaven. Do not say who's going to go down to the abyss. Christ has already come down. He doesn't have to come down again. The word is in our reach. But what does it say? The scripture, Paul says. Notice that Paul is quoting scripture like it's God speaking because it is God speaking. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So in other words, the gospel is calling for faith from you to Christ, to put your trust in Christ. And the word has the faith available for you to receive it. The word of God creates faith upon the hearing of the gospel message. Saving faith is in this message, if you can only receive it. The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you can own him today, amen? As your Lord and Savior, well, he owns you, but you get what I mean. You can take this on a personal, real level. Yes, Jesus is Lord, and I receive him now as my Lord and Savior. And believe in your heart. That's the very center of your being, where your whole life is given to him. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Oh, my friend, the gospel presentation is the resurrection of Jesus. It gives us hope. The price has been paid. The curse has been broken. We don't need to bear the penalty of our own sins. He's been raised from the dead. Notice this, though. You will be saved. Isn't that a promise from God? You will be saved, for with the heart one believes and is justified or declared righteous. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Oh, my friends, that's the good news right there. But the Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Call on him this morning. He will save you. He will receive you as he has promised in his own word. Receive him today for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's his promise, not mine. He has that kind of power. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you once again for this wonderful gospel. And Father, I thank you that though I could say apart from you, I was very wicked. You saved me, not on the basis of anything good that I did, but on what you did on that cross for me. And Father, we pray for each person here this morning. I don't know their life, their situation in every instance, but I pray that your word would be reiterated to hearts here today, that we would not be religious in the wrong sense of the word, Lord, but that we would receive the truth of your word, the truth of your grace. And you said, Lord, that we'll know the truth and the truth will make us free. Father, help us here to trust in your grace alone, in your faith alone for salvation. Forgive us, Lord, if we've gotten this wrong. Forgive us, Lord, if we've communicated something else to those outside and those who do not yet know Christ, but help us in this place to have a clear gospel of grace, a clear gospel that glorifies you and you alone. Touch hearts in this place today. Lord, you said that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. Father, we pray that you would draw men and women in this place and draw hearts in our community to you. 
Lord, may you turn these troubles that we've walked through into good in our communities, and may hearts be drawn to you at this time. Let us see many people come to Christ. As we close, guys, if anyone wants to receive Christ, come to me at the end and we'll, 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 we'll share more. But there is no reason why you should leave this place unsaved this morning. God bless you all. Amen.